Είμαι συνθέτη στο Καλατικό Ινστιτούτο για την α, απόψινή ε, διάλεξη. Ε, είμαι ο κ. Περός, αρκετόνι διευθυντής του Καλατικού Ινστιτούτου. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all with us uh, this evening. <coughs> We're still testing our new premises here, you see. So, uh, Jonathan in back, you have to tell me if you hear me clearly. Right? Okay. Come here. And uh, <coughs> uh, we hope that everything will uh, uh, go well this evening because we have a extremely interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I'd say this is uh, uh, our annual fellow lecture. Okay? Because our fellow this year is Katerina Apokatinidis, um, who is a PhD uh, student from the University of Toronto uh, in the Department of Classics over there. Katerina uh, works with Professor Sarah Murray um, on the archaeology on the archaeology of the Greek ritual and religion in the late archaic and early imperial period. She specializes in the materiality of the Orphic gold tablets and their role in Greek ritual. And this is the subject of her lecture this evening. Katerina obtained her BA in classical philology at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki <clears throat> and uh, for her first MA at Durham University in, the, in England she worked with Professor Johannes Humboldt on the role of woman in the, the Hesiodic catalog, uh, catalog of women. In particular she examined the significance of the mortal woman in the narrative as opposed to their half-divine children. For her second MA at the University of Waterloo, Ontario, you will have understood that she travels a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> she worked with Professor Andrew Faulkner on the gender interplay in Nonosis Dionysiaca. Here she studied the power dynamics between Dionysos and two of his most important enemies in Nonosis text as based on the reversal of gender expectations. Katarina's current work at the University of Toronto provides a new angle of examination of the relationship between mortals and gods in ancient Greek thought. It aims to reinterpret, to reinterpret the Orphic gold tablets by examining them as objects of occult practice and funerary culture which unified people from different social and political contexts as well as time periods transcending ties with the police. Katerina. So much. It's really good to be here. Um, so before I begin, uh, I would just like to thank the CIG for hosting tonight's event, and of course all of you for being here on this rainy afternoon. Now, uh, for today's talk, uh, I'll be sharing some of the work I have done for my uh, thesis research. Um, as the Nina and Friends Lipen Fellow, and uh, thanks to the generous support both of the CAG and uh, the University of Toronto's Archaeology Center, this year uh, I'm traveling within Greece and Italy to visit the museums which house the tomb assemblages of the worshippers of the Orphic Dionysus. The purpose of my research at this stage, uh, which comprises the initial phase of my PhD thesis, is to personally catalog, photograph, and measure all the burial goods that were found in the tombs in which were laid to rest to be initiates of a deity understood to be an Orphic version of Dionysus. And I'll get into who this god is in a moment. 
this research project aims to reinterpret the mortuary evidence of Orphic cult practice within the framework of lived religion. That's a term. Uh, now, before I explain exactly how I provide a reinterpretation of these tomb assemblages, uh, for the first half of my talk, I will briefly discuss you know, what these tablets are, uh, before giving a brief background about uh, of the religious belief behind their creation. For the second half of the talk, I will present two case studies, one from Berlina, near Larissa, and one from Spakaki, near Rethymno, and discuss some preliminary findings. Um, now, however, it must be kept in mind that this is very much a work in progress. Um, there is no kind of Aristotelian telos at the end of this presentation, uh, but I do look forward to any comments and suggestions that you may have during the Q&A, and of course, uh, after at the reception. Now, without uh, further ado, let's get into it and let's see if the technology is going to help. Yeah. Some of you may have heard of the Orphic Gold Tablets before, often referred to as Epistomia or Gold Lamellae, or perhaps you may have seen them displayed in museums like the one here in Athens, in Thessaloniki, or even in Naples, if you've been. But they are relatively unknown, both outside and within the archaeological community. They are thin, usually rectangular sheets of gold, as you can see, um, inscribed or uninscribed, and they seem to have been used as tickets or as mnemonic devices for the deceased to navigate the afterlife. The tablets were deposited in tombs throughout the Greek-speaking world from the late Archaic up to the Roman Imperial Era. They appear in Macedonia, <coughs> including Sicily and Calabria, the Greek mainland, including Macedonia, Thessaly, the Peloponnese, on the Greek islands, including Crete and Lesbos, as well as one in Asia Minor. These objects have been found on the chests of the deceased, in their hands or next to their hands, on their lips or close to their heads. From what we can understand based on a theological analysis of some of the inscribed tablets, they record what each deceased initiate should do upon their death to be free of the cycle of reincarnation on earth and enter the Elysian fields, a place traditionally reserved for heroes. So, what is the religious background which led to the creation of the Orphic gold tablets. Based on the inscribed textual evidence of the tablets themselves, these objects were commissioned for people who worshipped a different version of, um, previously unknown to us, of Dionysus. As we all know, Dionysus is the god that is commonly associated with wine, revelry, the theater, madness, out-of-body experiences, ecstasy, ecstasis, shamanic-like possession, enthusiasmos, and mountain orgies, though what we today understand to be orgies differs uh, significantly from what the ancient Greeks understood them to be. These were associated with women flocking to the mountains, the wild unknown, the untamed, and essentially having a party. These attributes may be familiar to you and <coughs> lucky, and I understand that they may be confusing because we have theater, we have madness and revelry, so there's a lot going on. But without going into too much detail, uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that the worship of Dionysus was meant to alleviate the, as I like to call it, earth experience. His primary gift to mankind, wine, <coughs> loosens tension in the limbs and muscles, brings people together, and creates merriment. <coughs> For the ancient Greeks, this all is done in Dionysus' name, as he helps keep, make our time alive uh, uh, something more than just surviving from the day, day to day. So who is Dionysus exactly, and why was he credited with such divine powers? Most, if not all of us, know Dionysus to be the half-human, half-divine son of Zeus and Semedi. Semedi is Cadmus and Armonia's daughter, and one of the princesses of Thebes in the kind of mythic landscape of Greece. This information comes to us firstly from Hesiod's Theogony, a text composed in hexameter verses detailing the birth of the gods of the ancient Greek pantheon. 
We also learn a lot about Dionysus from Euripides' Bacchae, uh, a play performed in Athens at the Theater of Dionysus in 405 BCE. There we see what he does to his enemies, uh, to all those who scorn his worship, when his adversary Pentheus is driven mad and then is dismembered by the hands of his own mother, Agave. In the Homeric hymns, those hymnic compositions of the Archaic Age, he is mistaken for a princess due to his soft features, abducted by pirates to be sold for ransom, but then gets his revenge by terrorizing the pirates to such an extent that they jump over their own boat and are turned into dolphins. And this is the mythic kind of uh, representation here, we have the dolphins, and Dionysus is somewhere here. <laughs> Fear and madness come to those who wrong or reject him, while those who embrace his worship share in his divinity by losing themselves into the group identity of being Dionysus's entourage. This is more clearly exemplified in the Bacchae, if some of you might know, when the chorus, the Bacchant women, are portrayed to be in harmony with nature as they suckle gazelles and wolf cubs while snakes cover their bodies without harming them. But the version of Dionysus we see in the Orphic Gold Tablets adds significantly more information to the persona of his godhood. In what is tentatively named the Orphic tradition, uh, a tradition which is understood by scholars today to have been the one behind the creation and distribution of these Orphic tablets, Dionysus is the third incarnation of the god Zagreus, or Zagreus in Greek. This Zagreus, according to the Orphics, is the divine son of Zeus and Persephone, the queen of the underworld. Now, Orphic myth tells us that when Zagreus was still a baby, the Titans, who had disguised their faces with plaster, used toys and specifically a mirror to lure him away from his mother. And then, you know, Zagreus was supposed to be Zeus's, in this mythic kind of tradition, Zagreus is, is supposed to be Zeus's successor to the cosmic throne. And so from a very early age, he became a target of malevolent forces. He was dismembered by the Titans, who then devoured the pieces of his small, divine body. However, before they were able to devour his heart, Athena was able to save it. Zeus then incinerated the Titans with his lightning bolt, and from those ashes, the Orphics believe, arose uh, humanity. In this way, the human race has a dual nature, one titanic and corruptible, their physical bodies, and one divine and immortal. That's the piece of Zagreus' body that was devoured, now becoming the spiritual body of humans, i.e. their soul. So each of us, you know, according to the Orphics, has a piece of Zagreus in us. Zagreus' heart was then incarnated as a different being, uh, the son of Zeus and Sinedi this time around, a fact which now, however, makes him half-mortal. As most of you know, the second birth of Zagreus, now as Semele's son and named Dionysus, was also interrupted, this time by Hera, who tricked Semele into requesting that Zeus appear before her in all his divine glory, thereby disintegrating her on the spot. Zeus was able to save the fetus Dionysus, this time placing him in his thigh until it was the right time for him to be born, making sure that he is born this time. And so the god we know from the more popular myths is the Dionysus born a third time from his father's thigh. So, how do the Orphic tablets fit into this mythos? Based on the philological analysis conducted both on the tablets and the only other direct piece of evidence of this cult, the Derveni Papyrus, those who follow the Orphic Dionysus learn of the ancestral crime committed by the Titans, so, which in this case are the ancestors of humans and thus know that they must seek Persephone's forgiveness, for their very presence in life is an affront to her. Many of the Orphic tablets record what needs to be said to Persephone once they are granted an audience with her, while others focus on how to get to Persephone in the first place. This is because upon entering the underworld, the soul is confused and in danger of repeating the never-ending cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. This latter idea is based on a common theme prevalent in many ancient religions on earth about reincarnation and about the soul's thirst upon death. 
The caveat, as we learn from the Orphic tablets, which is only revealed to the initiated, is that there are two bodies of water in the new world, one of oblivion, Lithi, and one of memory, Nimoshini. If the soul drinks from the waters of oblivion, they forget the life they just lived and remain stuck in this cycle of reincarnation. The first body of water the soul encounters upon arriving in Hades is that of oblivion, so we see why it is important to be initiated into these Orphic slash Bacchic mysteries. This cycle of death, rebirth, and death is understood as something that is imprisoning and that must be overcome. And so, those who know to wait move consciously within Hades, seeking out the second body of water. This is either a lake or a spring. The tablets are unclear on this, as some record the spring of memory and others the lake of memory. But all agree that it is to be found next to a white cypress tree, and it is guarded by unspecified guardians. Drinking from this body of water allows the soul to quench its thirst and retain the memory of life, the life that they lived. The soul is supposed to say a password of sorts to the guardians who will then allow it to drink. And this is, it varies from tablet to tablet, but it come, goes along the lines of um, I am the son, daughter, or child of the uh, earth and starry heaven, but my uh, lineage is uh, heavenly, allow me to drink. Something along those lines. <coughs> Presumably that line allows them to drink from the waters of memory. Uh, the soul is supposed to say this password, right, and then, you know, presumably after this, uh, they are allowed, they drink and then are allowed to move um, on in Hades, and then are granted uh, an audience with Persephone, in front of whom, again, the soul must utter a specific phrase so as to show that they have been absolved of their ancestral crime. This phrase is usually along the lines of, tell Persephone the, that uh, Bacchus himself has released you. And apparently that's enough. If all this is confusing, no worries. It's kind of supposed to be. Uh, the information I just went over is only a glimpse of a cult that was organized around the god of wine being humanity's savior. But we cannot pinpoint a clear chronology of mythic events, as some tablets simply record how to distinguish between the two bodies of water, while the others only refer to the audience with Persephone. In any case, once all of this is done, the soul is officially free of the cycle of reincarnation on Earth, and is then allowed to exist in perennial bliss in the Elysian Fields, a plane of metaphysical existence previously understood by scholars to be reserved for uh, heroes. And heroes, if everyone kind of remembers, are the half-divine, half-mortal children of gods. All this information has been gathered by the work of textual analysts and philologists who have focused on the literary dimension <coughs> of these tablets in connection with the Dermeni Papyrus. Uh, a brief note here, the Dermeni Papyrus, for those of you who who don't know, is a papyrus found in Derveni, near Thessaloniki, and records an Orphic theogonic text in circulation already in the early 4th century BCE. This theogony of Orpheus, the legendary poet and bard, expands on the Hesiodic and Homeric mythos of the universe and of Dionysus specifically. Based on all of this textual evidence, philologists have attempted to situate the Orphic tablets within a, mystery, a wider mystery cult. Alberto Bernabé and uh, Ana Isabel Jiménez San Cristobal, along with Fritz Graf and Sarah Isles Johnson, to name but a few, have all done exceptional work in understanding these Orphic tablets as textual references to a broader religious movement, which they have termed Orphic slash Bacchic, based on the main two male personae, Orpheus and Bacchus. Now, it's Orphic and Bacchic, Orphic slash Bacchic, because it's not just Orphic, or how we understand Orphism to be, what it is, and it's not just Bacchic or Dionysian, the way we understand we understood Dionysianism to be until these tablets came out. Vakos is a widely known cult epithet of Dionysus. Um, this persona of the god appears in the tablets specifically, albeit indirectly in the form of his initiates taking on the title of Vakhi or Bakoi. Uh, only in the cult of Dionysus do the worshippers take up the name of their god. This does not happen in other ancient Greek cults. You don't become the god, you just follow the god, the god, unless you follow Dionysus. Orpheus, we know, 
now, thanks to the Durango Papyrus, wrote a theogony of his own, which contained the full story of Zagreus, of course, among, among other themes. I have been referring to the religious practice as, you know, Orphic for simplicity's sake, but the official, if tentative, descriptive term is Orphic Bacchae. As a religious movement, it combines the Hesiodic and Homeric corpora with the new information of Zagreus known only through the tablets and the Durango Papyrus. Thus, you know, these two groups of evidence are the only direct proof for the existence of a funerary aspect of the worship of Dionysus tied to Orphic teachings. It is unclear if this Orphic tradition was hostile to the Hesiodic version uh, or vice versa, or if the worshippers of the Orphic Bacchic belief system thought of themselves as belonging to an elite that was more elite than the elites who did not follow the Orphic god Zagreus. But there is one thing we know for certain. The cult of the Orphic Dionysus was strong enough to endure the passage of time and follow its practitioners all over the Greek-speaking world. Its longevity and popularity was tied to individual worship, a fact which, as we'll see today, is expressed by the differentiation of mortuary depositional practices, but it was also linked to tradition and cultural context. So, let's look at some examples of the of this cult's mortuary practice. Uh, tonight, I present one grave from Berina and Thessaly, and four graves from Spataki, Crete, three of which yielded uninscribed tablets, and one uninscribed tablet, perhaps indicating that you know, the tablets did not need to contain texts in order to be considered effective grave goods. There is one theory expressed by Pavlos um for an uninscribed tablet found in Pella in Macedonia that these uninscribed tablets may have been written on in ink, uh, which of course is now lost, but you know, we cannot know this for sure, and perhaps you know, the words did not matter as much as the presence of the tablet in the tomb. But in any case, the first grave we'll see today is of a woman's found in ancient Pedna, like I said. So this is three kilometers from modern-day Barrio Mardiki, near the village Petropoulos in Thessaly. The burial rite was that of inhumation with the use of a marble sarcophagus. Uh, this burial yielded two nearly identical inscribed ivy-shaped Orphic tablets lying on the chest of the deceased. Berina, or Berineum, was a city-state of ancient Thessaly in the district of Histiotis, situated a little above the left bank of the Pineos River. So, she's right there. The grave dates to circa 275 BCE. It was uh, excavated by Thanasios Diafalias in 1985. The two tablets were published in 1987 by Tanzanogu and Barashogu, and um, at the time they revolutionized our knowledge of the texts of the uh, Orphic tablets as they contained new and important viewpoints about the belief system of this cult, which was previously unknown. Just to give you a sense about what the text looks like in these tablets. Uh, so these are the two from Berlina. They are two hexameters <coughs> followed by four prose lines and one hexameter line. And it reads something like, now, translation reads, Now you have died, and now you have come into being, O thrice happy one, on the same day. Tell Persephone that the Bacchic one himself released you. Bull, you jumped into milk. Quickly, you jumped into milk. And this line is missing from the text B. Ram, you fell into milk. You have wine as your fortunate honor. And below the earth are ready for you the same offices or rites for the word dela, right? Uh, as for the other blessed ones. And now this line is also missing from text B. The translation I provided is from Grafton Johnson in 2013. Now I won't go into to like more detail about the text, as this has been studied extensively by scholars with a lot more experience in philology than myself. But already you see some of the themes of the religious background shining through, like the concept of death as a rebirth, the epithet thrice blessed, indicating successful participation in mystery rites while alive, the presumption that the deceased will be granted an audience with Persephone, the claim that Bacchus himself has freed the deceased. 
that wine is the honor of the deceased, not just of Dionysus anymore, as the deceased as initiate has gained a high status within the cosmos. And the fact that that which awaits the deceased under the earth is all the other rites of the Blessed Ones. Regarding the rest of the great goods, <laughs> there seems to have been a lot of misunderstanding as to their exact number and nature. The record was finally set straight by Parker and Stamatopoulou in 2004, uh, who record the following objects. So the two ivy leaves were discovered with a vanaki with gorgon in the deceased female's mouth, a coin of Antigone Lunatas, a diadem-like wreath or with lead stem, gilt clay berries and gilt bronze myrtle leaves with a gold ornament in the cranium. Near the head was a clay aritir, uh, a clay bowl and two gold spirals ending in snake heads. And then near the feet was another clay aritir with a lamp inside of it, a clay ubuentarium, two bowls and a shallow skifos. And then by the feet again was a bronze levis, which is now in pieces containing the bones of an infant, which indicates that this grave probably belongs to a baby and its mother who died in childbirth. And then on the cover slab of the marble sarcophagus were two clay bowls and fragments of a third, a clay feeder, and a clay figurine of a comic actor sitting on an altar. So what are these objects, and what do they show us? In the context of a Greek burial, archaeologists refer to the term vanaki to denote a demonetized coin used as a form of charons oval. Traditionally, however, the vanaki is a small silver coin of the Persian Empire, equivalent to the Greek oval, which circulated among the Eastern Greeks. In Persia, the vanaki was originally a unit of weight for bulk silver, representing one-eighth of a shekel, which is 1.05 grams. For those of you unaware, the term charons oval refers to the payment charon, the ferryman of the underworld, receives to transport the souls of the dead across a charon and into the underworld. Usually this is placed on or inside the deceased's mouth. The Danaki from the Pedagon grave displays a common numismatic icon, which is the head of the Gorgon, a powerful protective symbol. So we see that's a little a clearer image of what this kind of image should look like, and then this is the Danaki found in the grave. Now, um, the coin of Antigonos Monadas, I think, was perhaps meant for as payment for the other soul in the grave, uh, which you know, this the, the the infant. But I was unable to see this coin, and this is going to be a common recurring theme. I was unable to see a lot of the stuff. The diadem-like wreath of lead stem, along with the gilt clay berries and the gilt bronze myrtle leaves with gold ornaments, all found around the cranium, suggest that the deceased had been a celebrated figure. Now, I was not able to see the wreath. This is just a, a gold myrtle wreath from somewhere else, the province is unknown. But just to give you an idea of what it would look like, those are myrtle leaves, like not real ones. Um, yeah, I, I don't think anyone knows where, where this is. I couldn't see it, so there's no photograph of it per se. I was only able to see the gold ornament uh, with what could be Rolekis. So this is the ornament here. You see how you know the technician kind of folded the gold? And I don't know if you can really tell, but to me this looks deliberate um, aesthetically. So it looks almost like a flower, maybe, and I don't know, when I saw it, I immediately thought about a rodaka. Rodax is like a rose for ancient Greeks, and a very, very common symbol in ancient Greece. Uh, you know, or, it, or it's nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, the golden snake-haired ornaments here, so the snake head, you can kind of see a very deliberate pressing at the end to show a snake's head. Uh, these may have been either a part of a headdress or they were used for hair decoration. I couldn't tell you, honestly. It is difficult now to understand how this individual was celebrated. If this was privately in her own ecos or publicly as a priestess, perhaps of this Orphic cult. Crowned individuals are usually victors of athletic games, or they are symposiasts, if they're not kings, 
queens, priests, and priestesses. It is unclear whether this woman from Berlin was officially crowned in some religious office, or if this is just a marker of her status as blessed symposiast within Dionysian religion, though admittedly you know, one interpretation does not contradict the other. In any case, scholars have interpreted the symbolism of the gilt wreath in Perina with uh, myrtle leaves within a religious framework. So myrtle trees are evergreens and were associated with fertility, vegetation, and the Clonian aspects of Dionysus, Demeter and Persephone, Aphrodite, and also perhaps Athena. Um, the next, right, the Aditi. So this is a clay vessel used for extracting wine out of a large storage vessel. Uh, inside of uh, one of these, the lamp was placed. So we have a lamp here, and it kind of, you, you can't really tell uh, from the picture, uh, but it, it is, it was a used item because it, I found burnt oil marks around here where the, the flame would have been. Um, next is, yeah, the Inguendarium is a vessel which is used to store perfumed oils. This specific one from the Bellina grave um, may have stored a perfumed oil either for, you know, the person, the, the woman herself, or for her baby, or for both. And then the two shallow bowls and the small skifos are objects used for <coughs> drinking wine, traditionally. The bronze levis was discovered by the feet and contained, as I said, the bones of the infant. Now, typically a, a levis is a vessel used for mixing wine with water. Uh, however, bronze ones um, were also used as cooking vessels. Uh, for this, they would have been placed on a base or a tripod. Uh, based on pictorial evidence from antiquity, the levy seems to have been given as a reward at games or was used just for serving wine at symposia. And this is the, this is the state of the levies today. <laughs> so, kind of sad. Uh, now, outside of the tomb, on top of the sarcophagus, the report indicates that there were two clay bowls and fragments of a third, like I said, a clay feeder and a figurine of a throne actor. So that's Let's look at all of these. Uh, the bowls have a peculiar egg-shaped decoration on the sides. It seems very deliberate. It's like very precise. Um, the figurine of the smiling, lounging actor, comic actor here, is hollow, as you can see. So it's, I've never seen something like that before. Um, and then the baby's feeder. Was, it's, uh, to me, it's like peculiar. I couldn't move remotely, as you can see, they're bolted down uh, in the museum kind of display box. Um, it, to me, it was peculiar that this was found outside the sarcophagus and not inside the levies where the infant was. But Now, you know, as we can all see, the some of the objects are for food and drinking wine, others are for beautifying. Some are for life during the night, as the you know, presence of the lamp indicates. And some, like the figurine, are more symbolic. The crowns and jewelry denote special status. Uh, so the, mom, the mother and the baby have their eating needs met separately, the mother drinking from her own vessels, the baby from the feeder. So it seems clear that the woman was prepared for participation in a dinner party as the celebrated individual that she was. This is the initial impression I'm getting from this tomb. Just admittedly not saying much. Now, let's go to Crete. Um, rescue excavations undertaken by the 25th effort of prehistoric and classical antiquities from December 1988 to June 1989, 1989 revealed a part of a Roman cemetery on the property of one Marcos Podivakis in the Svagaki region, which is approximately like eight kilometers east of Bethany. And is in close proximity to the better known uh, archaeological site of several manors in Hanarelli. The cemetery comprised of the following uh, 26 unlooted cis graves, which are graves in the shape of small, stone built coffin like boxes or ossuaries used to hold the bodies of the dead. Pit graves, which are shallow graves hollowed out of the bed of rock or the floor of the photos. And one pithos burial, burial. So a pithos is usually it's a very large uh, food storage vessel in this case, but it has been used also as a, a coffin. 
Now, all of the above were cut into a strip of land approximately seven meters wide in an east-west direction, about 30 kilometers from the shore. <clears throat> the first of the four graves which I present today is Cist Grave 9, dug in an east-west direction. It was constructed with rectangular slabs, and the skeleton of what was most likely a male was found in supine position with the head to the east. The bones of the thorax in the right hand were brittle on account of the grave's walls having caved in. The tablet that was found was uninscribed, and the grave goods consist of one clay procus, four glass cups, one glass fiari, one bronze legithion, one bronze strigil, one silver coin. Um, okay, so Crete was <laughs> an experience. It, uh, I did not see half of the objects. Uh, people don't know where they are. Um, it, there was a misunderstanding between the archaeologists who knew I was coming and the museum staff who didn't know and who refused to show me the objects and refused to allow me to take pictures even though I had the permit. It was a difficult three days in Crete, I, I can't lie. Um, so, anyways, these are the, the four tablets found from the specific cemetery. This is the one found in Cist Grey, what did I say, one? Or oh, nine, sorry, nine. This one right here. Uh, it's, it, the tablet measures uh, 0 0.004 by 0 0.016, and the thickness is about uh, 0 0.0001. has a rhomboid shape, which kind of imitates the mouth, in a way. Uh, and it was found under the right part of the cranium. It has suffered minor tears and wrinkles, uh, but it's pretty much clear, you know, what it is. Um, right, so like I said, <laughs> I did not see most of the objects. So I looked online to search for what each object is to show you just an approximate, like this is what something would have looked like in the ancient uh, times. Um, so, the prochus, I couldn't find specifically a prochus, but this is an inohoi, so something like that, is used for pouring water for the washing of hands, uh, most likely at symposia before meals. Uh, the glass cups were used for drinking, of course, but the fiali was used for hoes, or libations. Um, at the center of the, of the cup right here, the fiali, is, and I'll show you, I did, I did, I did see one of them. Uh, there's like, a, like an omphalos kind of like, a, like an indentation where the fingers would have gone. But as you see here, this is a representation from, a, from a, another amphora. So they had to, in order to like do this and you know, you won't drop the vessel. So this is the one I saw. And you can kind of see, you know, an indentation perfect for using, you know, your fingers. Uh, the strigil, <laughs> this strigil is actually from a different grave from the same cemetery. It is uh, from the grave not one, which also yielded a tablet, so it's not completely out, you know, out of whack. But um, I didn't see the one from that specific grave. But just to give you an idea of what a strigil is for those of you who don't know, it's a tool used to scrape the um, oil, uh, dirt, sweat uh, off the individual who would have entered a gymnasium, exercised, and would have been anointed with oil, and then of course, you know, rolled around in dirt and dust and sand. So that all is difficult to take off, um, to wash off, uh, because of the oil. So you would have used this, this tool to, to, to scrape everything off. And you can't really see from the picture um, that, which is why I wanted to go and look at the objects, but uh, there is a, this is my sad attempt at making a sketch of the um, pattern. To me, that kind of looks, that kind of looks like an ivy leaf, but again, it could be nothing. Um, the important thing about the strigil is that this is a tool that kind of hints at high-worn status because Normally, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use the strigil on yourself. Uh, someone else would be the one strigiling. Uh, <laughs> and um, so, I mean, of course, usually those people are slaves. Uh, so, you know, from a small object, we already kind of can maybe tell, you know, again, conjecture, but you can tell that this person is an important, an important person, wealthy enough to own slaves. 
Uh, I was unfortunately unable to see the coin, any of the coins. <laughs> no coins. Coins are notoriously difficult to see. Uh, aside from being just people not knowing where things are, um, it's, it's a whole different permit process. So I don't, I don't know what's on the coin. <laughs> and I can't show you. Um, now, the other grave. Cyst Grave 4. Uh, this was uh, on display in the museum in uh, Yekimno. Uh, of course, you know, some of the objects are missing, so I don't know... I, 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 no more. Okay. Um, now, this grave is, in, again, in an east-west uh, direction. It was constructed by rectangular slabs, <coughs> again, so construction, right, not just a hole in the ground. Uh, the skeleton of what was likely a female this time was found in supine position with the head to the east. The grave goods consist of one clay kirix, one clay prochus, four clay uguadaya, one clay cup, one bronze mirror, right there, um, one lead pixis, and bronze nails. Now, the pixis is like a, a box, a jewelry, jewelry box, or a box containing uh, makeup paraphernalia. The tablet itself, uninscribed again, uh, measures about uh, 0 0.016 to 0 0.018 by 0 0.053, uh, with a thickness of, again, 0 0.0001, and was found on the upper mandible of the cranium, so about, like, somewhere here, uh, damaged by the fallen earth and the caving in of the graves, northern wall. But it is, you know, in excellent condition, considering it has an oblong shape, and the corners are a little bit protruding, and there's, I don't know if you can tell, but there's, like, a net-like pattern, um, which is peculiar, uh, it was probably kind of folded that way. The Kilix is a wine drinking vessel specifically, and uh, you can kind of see here, it's like a nice one. Uh, uh, yeah, the Pixis is uh, a box, and we, I, I showed you a little bit earlier what a Pixis would have looked. Can we go back? Yes, perfectly. Here, that's some like it could have looked something like that. That's a kylix, um, you know. Then I yeah, I wasn't able to see any of these. I don't know what the nails were for. Um, the pieces was a bronze one, so it could be that the nails were from that. But it highly doubtful. It was probably from a, a different vessel, which was most likely made out of wood and destroyed because of the passage of time. Uh, the next one that I have, um, let's see, let's go back, I if I can, yeah, these are the Uguendaria, um, they, and, uh, this is a Prokush. The, okay, so since grade 20, I was not able to see any of the objects, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, but according to the report, uh, it is in an east-west direction as well. It was constructed again with rectangular slabs, and two skeletons were found, one, uh, both in supine position with the head to the west. They were placed successively, uh, so skeleton A buried later and facing north, uh, which the skeleton is perhaps of a male, and then skeleton B, which is an older burial, probably female, facing south. Now, the grave goods ha are, again, one clay brochus, three arigaros shaped likithia, which is like a smaller, stouter form of this, just, just short. Um, one clay guadari, one clay cup, one glass fiali, and one bronze coin again, found on skeleton A. The oblong tablet, uninscribed again, and measuring about 0 0.015 by 0 0.037, with a thickness of 0 0.0001 was found in the bones of the cervix of skeleton B. Between the legs of this skeleton were also discovered bronze foils, which <coughs> probably had originally plated a wooden pixis, you know, or garments, it's unclear. Now, the tablet is preserved in excellent condition with minor wrinkles. It has a chest-like pattern, so it's this one right here. I don't know if you can see, uh, it's a, I, as you can see, I couldn't photograph these uh, properly because I wasn't allowed to touch them. Um, but there, yeah, there's like a chest-like pattern here. The final grave for today, the contents of which, again, I was unable to see, uh, is cyst grave one. Uh, it's well preserved as a, as a grave. I, I read about 
Uh, it was constructed out of rectangular slabs again, um, and these appeared uh, to have been used before somewhere else. Um, this is indicated by one of the covering slabs. So it's interesting how these slabs were from something else and then used for this for this grave. The skeleton was found in an extended supine position, with the head to the east and leaning to the north towards the sea. Husula uh, Burbu's study of the remains has shown that the deceased was a young adult between 25 to 35 years of age and was probably male. In addition to the tablet, which this one is inscribed, uh, it's this one, no, it's this one here actually. Um, we have one small clay brocus again, one small bronze brocus, one clay inquentarium, one arivaloshi plicithion, two glass viale, one bronze strigil, one obsidian flake, one bronze coin discovered on the skeleton's chest. Again, I was unable to see the bronze coin. Uh, but it was studied by Tiantis Sibiropoulos this time, yeah, so this one was studied, and is believed to be a Viovolon of Augustus issued by the Alexandria Mint in uh, 30 to 28 BCE. It is, this is a rare issue. Uh, it's termed by some scholars as the numismatic epilogue of Ptolemies. Uh, it was minted immediately after the formal incorpor incorporation of Egypt into the Roman Empire. And the appearance of it on Crete is very rare, uh, which you know, is also remarkable. It's like, who is this person? Uh, its state of preservation indicated that the coin was used for a few decades before it was placed in this grave. The tablet, uh, measuring um, 0.012 to 0.018 by 0.075, has a thickness <coughs> less than uh, 0.0001. Is the is in the shape of the mouth and was discussed. You can kind of tell, and it was um, <coughs> discovered on the base at, at the base of the skull. Uh, Yanis Dipopoulos believes that the position on the lips of the deceased and subsequent slide have caused the minor damages that you can see um, and the numerous wrinkles. Um, however, this damage could also be due to the earth just falling in the grave. Now the text, because this is inscribed, although you can, I don't know if you can even tell, you see the text reads Plutoni and Persephone. Uh, you kind of see the P here, the Lamba, uh, I see the Phi here and the Epsilon, but the, the rest is like, wow, okay. Uh, now these two words are in the dative, so an implied greetings is, uh, but it should be implied. And it reads, so greetings, parenthesis, and then two Pluton and Persephone, and of course, as you all know, uh, these are the two most important deities of the underworld. Now, all, with all of this in mind, like what exactly am I working on? Uh, as briefly mentioned earlier, uh, this research project aims to kind of reinterpret this mortuary evidence of Orphic cult practice, um, as examples of which we kind of saw. Now, I do this within the framework of lived religion by employing a mortuary analytic <coughs> of death as a continuum. But what do these terms mean? <laughs> now, as we saw, the presence of the Orphic tablet within the tomb, or, or within a tomb, is the only common object, right? I mean, there are others, but the most important one is this, because this object alerts us to the fact that the deceased was a follower of this cult. None of the other objects can tell us that. Uh, now, so the others vary from grave to grave, but in conjunction with the tablet, they can nevertheless help illuminate certain aspects of mortuary religion and funeral deposition practices previously unknown. The lived religion model provides a useful interpretive method to work with uh, when interpreting this material. That's what, that's what I believe here. Um, now, this is because lived religion focuses on the actual everyday experience on practices, expressions, and interactions that could be related to religion. Such religion is understood as a spectrum of experiences, uh, of actions, of beliefs, and communications hinging on human communication with superhuman or even transcendent agents. Material symbols, elaborate forms of representation, and ritualization are called upon for the success of communication with these addressees, with these metaphysical addressees. Lived religion focuses on a historical and cultural approach to the study of material remains within religious contexts, going beyond the literary evidence uh, for ancient Greek religious ideology. With the lived religion framework in mind, the tomb can be understood as one aspect 
of the spectrum of the religious experience of believing in an afterlife. This belief in the afterlife itself being one aspect of religion more broadly. Now the lived religion model is then enriched by the uh, death as a continuum analytic. So yeah, what is this analytic? Uh, so archaeologists have challenged the binary divide between a living and a dead body. Work has been done to show that matter is not inert and that death is a continuous process. This means that the body undergoes transformations from living to dying to ultimately turning into bone. It's not just alive one time, one moment and then dead in the next. This process of dying, as exemplified by the slow decomposition of the corpse, needs to be reevaluated as a determining factor for the creation of the funerary context itself. This strand of mortuary archaeology argues that the funerary context is also dependent upon the idea of death as a continuous process. In this light, the study of the tomb assemblages needs to incorporate the dynamic relationship between the dead, dying body and the society that dealt with it. So in many ways, the work of the archaeologists, you know, it's to speak with the dead via objects. And this is possible because the material culture is not passive and inert. It does not have processes happen to it. It is an active agent for the production of meaning. Material culture is created by humans to stimulate, prompt, or determine social action. The materiality of death includes most aspects which are concerned with bodies, burials, and beliefs. This is because death is as much a social as it is a religious process, and both processes are material. They are actively materialized by the descendants, <coughs> those who gather to perform the burial itself. So, what I'm proposing with my work is a new kind of hybrid method which combines elements of the lived religion model with the conception of death as a continuum. The strength of this method does not lie in its focus on reconstructing a system of belief that is lost to us in any case. Instead, it, le it lies in offering the possibility of viewing the Orthic religious movement as a part of its members' in its everyday life. It discusses in which ways the effectiveness of the ritual practice as informed by religious belief was most successfully achieved. This, this effectiveness would entail, as we saw earlier, the desired outcome for the deceased to enter the Elysian fields and break free of the cycle of reincarnation on Earth. Graves were media for the communication of societal ideas about the structural relations between the living and the dead, the present and the afterlife, as well as the representation of the community ideals of how to commemorate and stage the deceased. Everyday items such as bowls or you know, more precious items such as jewelry reflect a need to maintain the deceased's social standing in the afterlife along with their social identity. The social standing of an individual crossed over with them in the afterlife at least that's what the ancient Greeks believed, an idea that is contrary to modern beliefs about the afterlife as, you know, offering kind of like this clean slate for the deceased. You know, our wedding vows in the Christian tradition state that the union is in effect till death do us part. For the ancient worshippers of the Orphic Dionysus, at least, death did not separate the deceased from their worldly attachments. They took those with them. Their worldly attachments comprised their identity, and this they retained most importantly upon their death because in this way they would be able to live on in the afterlife. Crossing over to the final stage of existence was a ritualized process imbued with belief and expressed in material culture. And it was also a social process. Now, as is no doubt clear, with this project I go beyond a textual analysis and reinterpret these tablets along with their archaeological assemblage as objects that are meaningfully constituted. The tomb itself has a lot to offer for interpretation in this light. Such an analysis has not been done for these funerary objects, not for the tablets, nor for the rest of the objects. And so I hope to enrich our understanding of the funerary aspect of this Orphic cult, previously understood to be operating on the fringes of official religion in ancient Greece. I illustrate how the interpretive possibilities afforded by close examination of burial goods allows us an unusual glimpse into the way the religious belief permeated every aspect of the lives of its practitioners. In doing so, the study highlights the extent to which personal ritual was as central to ancient religious practice as polis-centered or official cult was. 
Now, the next stop for me is to visit the archaeological museums in Volos, Thessaloniki, and Vigo Valentia in Italy. And I'm, I'm hoping for Naples. I still, I've contacted them multiple times. I have not heard back, but I'm, I'm still hopeful. Uh, now, one final note. My analysis in the dissertation is, you know, understandably, it's kind of limited to mortuary assemblages with a reliable publication record. Unfortunately, the graves containing the Orphic tablets are prime targets for looting due to the presence of gold in them, which means that for many of the tablets that have surfaced, the archaeological context has been lost. We have about 50 of them, and I showed you what, like four or five. And I don't have that many else because we've just lost the context. They've been stolen, they've been sold. The other objects? Ugh. So, you know, this understandably limits the scale of data available for analysis, but despite the small quantitative scale, you know, each tomb under study, I think at least, offers considerable insight into the nature of cult in a particular local and temporal context while also hinting at a, religion, at a religious tradition spanning centuries. Um, yeah, so thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for your time. <laughs>
In short, no. Um, but you know that the fact that we found these tablets, it kind of shows us that what other kind of evidence should we be looking at? Um, were there other stuff that indicates that this this is a follower of the Orphic Dionysus, or you know, are they are there other? It kind of like opens up a new kind of strand, uh, a new question to, to 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 question the evidence that we already have that did not yield a tablet, but could have the same kind of iconography that maybe we didn't know to look for, and now that we do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one very quick question and yeah. another question. So yeah. is, is the idea that it was always supposed to be on the mouth and then sometimes it just fell? Do they think that it was always placed on the mouth? Most of them, yes. Because most of them were found around the cranium. That would make sense. Like, yeah. it's like a mouthpiece. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. Almost like a mouthpiece sense. because, you know, the idea is that, uh, you know, to me, the image is that when, when this individual arrives in the afterlife, having the gold piece on their mouth just shows immediately. Yeah, like an indicator. Yeah, because the mouth, exactly, it's like an indicator, and the mouth is, you know, is how they would communicate with uh -huh. the underworld deities. So even the fact that, you know, some of them are uninscribed, it doesn't really matter because right. the presence of the tablet itself That's what is I thought, important. because the first time you said that, I said, well, that's silly. Of course that had to have writing on it. And then mm -hmm. by the end of that, I was like, Maybe Actually, not. Maybe not. Yeah. It was just there. Mm -hmm. Some of them are more intense because you, you can see the shape of the mouth. Uh -huh. Some of the rectangular ones were rolled up and were rolled up and placed within the mouth, within mm -hmm. the mouth cavity, and of course, kind of fell through the just because of the you know, decomposition. Yeah. But some of them are not. Some of them were found in the hand. Some of them in the chest, like the pedigree ones. Interesting. Yeah. How how would you get involved in a cult like this? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. I'm interested, no, I'm oh, honestly, yeah. though. I mean, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't you know this is actually, you know? Yeah, exactly. The first meeting. <laughs> right. Um, we don't know. Okay. Uh, we don't know what to do with this skull. Because, like, is it peripheral? We, we can't tell. We don't, we don't know. It seems to be some of these aspects, you know, people, scholars, philologists, to be, to be clear, philologists believe that this is a peripheral uh, elite. Uh, religious movement and it's an elective cult so it's a cult that is not offered to the to the wide you know plebs it's only for us elites but <laughs> there's no the evidence doesn't actually tell us that mm -hmm. it just tells us that there's this strand of Dionysus that we didn't know about mm -hmm. and that perhaps is visible in his other cults that are mystery cults that we have no information on so you know it, it's Putting these lines and boundaries uh, just based on texts it doesn't it doesn't help uh, interpretation. So I can't answer your question. Um, I don't know, believe in Dionysus, and he'll show you the way. Okay. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. for the presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, is this a regional difference, or is it a uh, cultic symbolism? It's or difficult to tell. Um, it, it, when you're trying to like draw these overarching conclusions, you you can't tell. Immediately then there's a grave found, but you know, the, the shape is in ivy leaves, so it's like, oh, okay, well. Um, so I think, I think it's about personal choice, or what was available at the time of death, or even what was available during the ritual practice, or it's, it's, I think it's based on personal choice. The deceased, the initiate himself or herself, <coughs> decided what the tablet would look like and what it would contain, like what information it would contain, if it contained information, uh, you know, if, if, it, if it contained words. Um, or it could be tied within the religious kind of ritual practice. So someone would have a mouthpiece because they are an ex have ex office within this cult, and you know the Perina woman had you know two two chest pieces, which probably adorned you know a, 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 a sort of a hitom right like, like a clo clothing. So why did she choose that? That we can't tell. It's just it's so differentiated because we do have some that are the same, but uh, you know also others are not. So it's so differentiated that we believe it's just it's personal choice. Uh, and the, the second question is about the Pelina uh, grave. Uh, the child that was found there, 
was it common for children to be initiated into a cult like this, or is this very uncommon? And if it is, why is this child there? Was it like emergency because they knew that the child was sick? Mm -hmm. Because the cult seems much like a personal choice to mm -hmm. go into this orphic cult. Thank you. That's actually a really good question. I'm going to make a note of that because um, so the presence of the child. Pre ch children in um, graves are a common motif. This is not a new thing. Uh, and it usually, you know, it's believed to, to follow the death of the mother during childbirth. Uh, so they, they both kind of died and so they were buried together. Uh, now the, the mode of burial differs. So this, this, I think the, I, I believe the child was cremated. Um, so there's, yeah. Because uh, the, the levis is like a, I mean it's a, it's a big vessel, but it's like a bowl. So even if a small child, I don't know if you can fit it with dignity. <laughs> like, because otherwise you're kind of stuffing it, and I don't, I don't think, you know, this is this is a funeral. Like people wouldn't be handling the remains that way. There would be more respect and more, you know. So I can't tell you for sure if uh, we haven't. Children are a good or a cool kind of chapter within this stream this kind of religious thing but you know children in ancient Greece kind of were born into something that their parents were already doing so most likely they were born to take over and take after whatever the parents were uh, in the business of yeah. and in this case they would they would you know the, the the hope would have been to be also kind of elected into into priesthoods or or not um, so yeah to answer your question I can't tell you for sure. The, the, the child did not have the tablet. Uh, there was the coin in there, and also the vanaki. So in the, the, the perima. No, well, the coin was in the grave. I, don't, I can't tell you where, because yeah. it's unclear. Yeah. Uh, but the presence of the coin, the one singular coin, and the vanaki, which is already a Haram's oval, indicates that, oh, maybe the payment was for two people. So they're going together to the afterlife. The, 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 the deceased is retaining their um, I, it's okay. uh, retaining their um, identity as mother, which is a social identity in the afterlife and the child is kind of kind of going with. Um, yeah. Yeah. But thank you. That's a that's a good question. We can't know for sure. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question concerning uh, Orphic rituals. Yes. And their connection to rituals of other religions. Yes. Uh, I understood that Part of the Orphic rituals involved uh, taking God inside mm -hmm. uh, through a process of eating mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. In that case, to what extent the Holy Communion in Christianity mm -hmm. relates to Orphic rituals? Mm -hmm. well, Did anybody study the connection between Orphic rituals and Christian mm -hmm. rituals? That's a good question. There's, there's been multiple studies. Christianity came late into, you know, a cultural context that had numerous religious practices. It, could, it, it took from a lot of traditions, right? It's, it's based on numerous traditions, because otherwise it wouldn't have survived. You can't just come offer stuff that people won't relate to and expect to be, to be able to create a cult, because like no one will follow you. You have to adopt certain things, certain aspects. Um, now, regarding this specific uh, Orphic eating, I, this is a, I'm very early on in this, uh, in this research. I, haven't, I don't know the evidence for Orphic eating. I don't know where, this, where does this come from. Is this from... Uh, most of the stuff we know on Orphism comes from the first few centuries AD, CE. So this is after Christ. Um, the Neoplatonists also kind of refer to these things, which are all later. I'm looking at stuff that are really significantly earlier. Um, they, there are, of course, uh, there are like stuff that you see from Pythagorean, Pythagoras and his kind of mystic cult that you see shining through in this, in this specific uh, cult. But this specific cult with these tablets, with this information on Zagreus and on eating, I, you know, my initial... Um, uh, kind of, what's the word, instinct is, yeah, they're all related, it has to be, because you're devouring, because Zagreus himself is devoured. Um, so, 
I think they're all related, but I just don't know to what extent, and I would have to look at the evidence more closely on orphism specifically. Yeah, but thank you, yeah. Um, I, I have a question about the goods in the tomb and about your comment uh, about how the deceased would be taking these objects with them into the afterlife mm -hmm. and never change their status. Um, I was just wondering what the evidence we have is for that belief, because I think there are a lot of different ways you can look at grave goods in a tomb, right? You can think of it as uh, they're not even, they don't even belong to the deceased, right? They're objects given by the mourners to the, to the person as part of a kind of, the, as part of the mourning process. Um, you know, they could be the remains of a, a funeral meal, right? Like with the pouring shapes and, and things like that. Um, and, and I mean, especially right, the pouring shapes would be uh, interesting given Dionysus connection with wine. Uh, so, yeah, but I was just wondering about that. I also have a more sort of like a speculative question. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you. That's a good question. <laughs> no, honestly, like, like I, I, I'm really early in this. I, I have a philology background. So, the, what I said was mostly in my first head instinct in looking at the objects and what are they telling us? Because, why? I mean, I guess for economy reasons, you would. Specifically, this got me thinking, this kind of idea came from looking at the Pelina, uh, burial deposition, because why not bury the child somewhere else? Why not just cremate and then just leave it somewhere else? Why bury it with the mother? So to me, that says that this mother, this female, is also a mother in the afterlife. To, that's what it kind of says to me. You know, she's crowned. Uh, why is she crowned in the, in, the gra in the grave? Like, why are they? These are all personal objects in my mind of hers. And I think you're right in, in saying that, you know, it could be just other objects that the, that the person didn't need. But then you have the feeder also. Now, some of them, of course, I think you're right. But then you have the, the tablets themselves. Then you have the, the crown that is hers. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of, to me, indicates that maybe we're talking about a, a, con a continuous. Um, process of going from from because like afterlife is seen as afterlife death is not the end death is just a portal a door through which we enter and then we we live in the afterlife um i have a small anecdote like my, my dad passed away two years ago and we deposited stuff in his kind of coffin that were not his but were associated with him um so of course i mean this is like 2500 years later but there does seem to be a connection, in my mind at least, with the individual and the objects that are with them in the, in the grave. Well, I, you know, I think too, right, this idea of drinking from the late memory suggests yeah. that they are taking something of their previous life. Yeah. Um, the other sort of more speculative question that I had was, you know, there do seem to be tombs where they have a tablet and a coin. Um, so what do you think the implications of that are, right? Do you think that that suggests that I mean, are they hedging their bets, like, just in case, you know, like, like oh, this doesn't work out, but I also want a coin. Um, or is it, or is it maybe um, they get past the guardians and then they go mm -hmm. to see Charon, right? What does that suggest mm -hmm. about, like, the mental geography of the world, you know, for like so many I wish I knew. Yeah, I, I, I so wish because, like I said, their chronology is out of whack. We don't like when, when, when does the soul come? Uh, in front of the, the guardians in the body of water. Is it upon, is it after Haram? Presumably yeah. it is because the bodies of water are within Hades anyways and Haram gets you into Hades. So, you know, the Begina has a Danaki, which is a Haram wall, the tablets, and also the coin, which to me, I, I think, is also for the other soul. Um, but then you have the one of the graves in Svakaiki where you have the, the woman with uh, the tablet and the male with a coin, not a tablet. So does this indicate, you know, like you said, like was that enough? Was being buried with someone with a tablet enough? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I feel like the coin for Harun, right? Harun is would be the initial uh, kind of Thank you. Katerina, I stop.
Uh, we, we make it discuss because Catalina, I, I don't know if you noticed, she wasn't very lucky with her coins. So, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that. Maybe tonight, yeah. in the Vasilopi I'll be lucky. Thank you. <laughs>